What happened to National Lampoon? What started as a cult comedy magazine that represented a generation seemed to eventually diverge into a series of low-budget, smutty comedies that made even the direct-to-video American Pie sequels look highbrow. Take a look at this. I'm referring to movies like National Lampoon's One Too Many, a starring vehicle for stuttering John Melendez on his quest to have a threesome. Or National Lampoon's TV the Movie, a sketch comedy that starred most of the Jackass crew. And how could anyone forget National Lampoon's Holiday Reunion, which starred Judge Reinhold and a pre-Breaking Bad Brian Cranston as feuding relatives in an attempt to make a new vacation series. Joe? Ah, what are you doing? Look, look I'm, just, I'm just soaping you up, man. Here, you do me. Speaking of the vacation series, one of the biggest crimes committed by the post-90s Lampoon was National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation 2, Cousin Eddie's Island Adventure, in 2003. I guess now there's a second. Both the first Christmas Vacation and the holiday itself have pretty much no bearing on the plot of this movie. Christmas is incidental. The real plot, as the subtitle suggests, finds Cousin Eddie and his family being stranded on a desert island. Well, that island looks nice, not too far. Alright, I'm gonna try to swim to shore. I bet there's nothing dangerous on these islands, right, Milwaukee Licky? Now, along with this just being an awful movie, I actually find it to be the perfect representation of everything that went wrong with National Lampoon. I'm just one big disappointment. And therefore, it's still worth discussing. That'll do it. So how did National Lampoon go from this... <laughs> ...to this... Oh, my god, that was a nice thrust. And watch this. You like that? I like it a lot. Well, let's find out. I'm gonna kill myself. The year was 1978. National Lampoon's Animal House was released in July of that year and became the highest grossing comedy at the time. The movie, the first foray into feature films by National Lampoon magazine, was the perfect combination of elements. A tight script by Howard Ramis, Chris Miller, and Doug Kenny, director John Landis at the helm, and the casting of John Belushi, his first time leading a film. And then there was also producer Maddie Simmons. Simmons, originally the head of Weight Watchers magazine, became an instrumental figure in launching National Lampoon to a wider audience. The Lampoon uh, started in 1970 as kind of an offshoot of the Harvard Lampoon. Uh, mm -hmm. I was in the publishing business and I brought in two or three editors from the Harvard Lampoon and we started a humor magazine. Simmons controlled the business side of the magazine, and therefore when the time came to produce Lampoon movies, he was the man in charge. Now, following the success of Animal House, National Lampoon actually stumbled to find their next hit for quite a while. Their second film, National Lampoon's Class Reunion in 1982, the first movie written by John Hughes, failed to reach even a small percentage of the financial success achieved by Animal House. Just a total flop, let's face it. As did their sketch comedy, Movie Madness, the same year. A picture with drama. You can't touch me, coppers! I got a lawyer! How about we grab a sandwich? My drink! Romance! I feel happy with you. And I with you. All right, break it up, break it up. I've had it with guys like you. Holy cow! It was then Maddie Simmons who decided to return to basics for their fourth movie, championing a short story that originated in the magazine, Vacation 58, by John Hughes as the next Lampoon movie. When I was a boy, just about every summer we'd take a vacation. And you know, in 18 years, we never had fun. By securing Howard Ramis as director, 
and assuring John Hughes that his script would not be retooled, as was the case with Class Reunion, National Lampoon finally managed another hit. Yellow. Okay, I'm okay. While a TV series follow-up to Animal House had failed, Simmons saw the potential in a vacation franchise, and for the rest of the 1980s, Lampoon produced only vacation sequels theatrically. The ownership of National Lampoon magazine changed hands in 1989, and the film division was then sold off to J2 Communications in 1990, which is why Vegas Vacation, released in 1997, lacks the branding. J2 would then license the National Lampoon moniker to other comedy movies looking to up their commercial value, and this is where things started to take a turn for the worst. While National Lampoon's Loaded Weapon 1 in 1993 seemed to breathe new life into the brand, Sergeant Colt, Metropolitan Police Department. This is Sergeant Luger. We're commandeering your vehicles. A slew of other duds forced J2 to sell National Lampoon to producer Dan Lakin in 2001. This new company, branded National Lampoon Inc., seemed willing to license the name to just about any movie, regardless of quality. They didn't even seem to care how their name was used, either, with some of the movies being branded as National Lampoon Presents, while others as just National Lampoons. <laughs> you folks here are treating us in style. <laughs> this is how we got such acclaimed classic movies as National Lampoon Presents Jake's Booty Call, National Lampoon's Barely Legal, National Lampoon's Adam and Eve, National Lampoon Presents Cattle Call, National Lampoon's Pucked, National Lampoon's Stoned Age, National Lampoon Presents Robodoc, National Lampoon's Transylvania, National Lampoon Presents Endless Bummer, National Lampoon's Dirty Movie, and finally, National Lampoon's Another Dirty Movie. Hallelujah! Holy shit! Where's the Tylenol? The last major theatrical success for the brand came in 2002 with National Lampoon's Van Wilder, which they then milked with two awful sequels. By 2009, National Lampoon Inc. realized they had a big problem, as pretty much all of their licensed movies were stuff like this. Speaking to the New York Times in 2007, National Lampoon Inc. executive Dan Lakin stated, The company really had just been a licensing company in the 90s. We were just licensing the name and we had no creative input. When I came in, we had to re-energize the brand and cut back on the licensing, because the only way to take control of the brand was to make sure that ultimately we put it on projects that we are proud of. So what was the first project they were evidently proud of, you ask? This. In the third world, a brutal dictator has ordered his son to an American university. But when he arrives, he learns what it takes to really rule the school. We shall have a problem! And he's sparing no expense for higher education. Durango! Durango! You should be ashamed! But money can't fix everything, especially when it comes from that man. You are my father. Get it! National Lampoon's Ratko, the dictators. National Lampoon only produced a handful of other movies before they were sold to Palm Star Media in 2017, who primarily uses the brand for podcasts today. I'm a zit. Get it? Alright, so let's jump back to the middle of all this mess, 2003, shortly after National Lampoon Inc. was formed. Maddie Simmons had not really been involved in a National Lampoon type of movie since Vegas Vacation in 1997. As he had produced every film in the franchise, a sequel could not be made without his involvement. So when Warner Brothers noted the growing cult popularity of Christmas Vacation 1, they commissioned a TV movie follow-up. I can hunt for food! Oh, Eddie, the other place you ever hunted for food was our refrigerator. Ah. Matty Simmons executive produced and wrote the script himself, only his second film screenplay behind something called Baby Huey's Great Easter Adventure.
Now look, this is not to say that Maddie Simmons wasn't a talented guy. National Lampoon Magazine and arguably Animal House and Vacation probably would not exist without him, but he was not a screenwriter. Case in point, this movie. That's a terrible thing to say. Well, the boy's right. Randy Quaid returns as Cousin Eddie. Now, I can't be certain, but I'm convinced that Matty Simmons had originally conceived this movie to be just Cousin Eddie's island vacation or something like that, with it originally having nothing to do with Christmas. I say this because the movie has almost nothing to do with Christmas. Excluding the occasional establishing shot, background extra dressed as Santa, or the occasional Caribbean Christmas song, The holiday itself has no bearing on the plot. I think Simmons just was sitting on the script and then shoehorned in the holiday theming when Warner Brothers commissioned a direct sequel to the 89 movie. <laughs> this is the way you folks show your apologies. <laughs> that monkey can bite my ass every day of the week and twice on Sunday. <laughs> the problem with this movie begins as soon as the main menu appears too, with them using Comic Sans as the menu font. Could you imagine something that terrible happening right before Christmas? <laughs> now, the vacation movies worked their best when the comedy came from a real place. Upon those family frustrations that we've all experienced, even if they were exaggerated in the movies, they were still relatable scenarios. Here, that premise is dialed up to the extreme. Destruction doesn't build gradually and with purpose, it just happens. And then goes on. And on. And on. I mean, can anyone relate to this that's not the Three Stooges? <laughs> also returning is Miriam Flynn as Cousin Eddie's wife, Catherine. I mean, we've never had a real vacation. It'll be an adventure. As well as Dana Barron as Audrey Griswold, returning to the role for the first time since the original movie. This makes her the only actress to play a Griswold kid more than once. And honestly, she's one of the better parts of the movie, except that her character is scripted as being miserable, because she's going through a breakup. I'm thinking about killing myself. Or, or eating large amounts of ice cream. I'd go for that ice cream deal. And it ultimately goes nowhere. Vacation franchise staple Eric Idle also returns. What's that? You don't remember Eric Idle's iconic role as the bike rider from European Vacation? Hey, I guess look who it is, say hi! Hi! hi. Hi. At least in that movie, his role makes sense because they're in Europe. And he has a fun recurring gag where the Griswolds keep running into him. But here, his involvement makes no sense. This sort of thing happens to me all the time. <laughs> You're foreigner, ain't you? <laughs> what are you? Uh, I, I'm, I'm English. Oh, <laughs> well, you sure do talk pretty. I think he's only in this movie because much like the National Lampoon name, some studio executive thought it'd be a good marketing ploy. He even gets his own special credit in the opening titles. The weird combination of elements from the earlier movies really make this movie feel like a fever dream that you would have after getting drunk and marathoning all the movies in one sitting. Ah, thanks. I needed that. But there's also some new characters like Eddie's son, Third, played by Lizzie McGuire's brother, and Uncle Nick, played by Ed Asner. This means that 2003 saw Ed Asner in two vastly different Christmas movies. Mr. Christmas himself, Saint Nick. Oh. What in the name of Sam Hill is that? Though Uncle Nick lacks some of Santa's, uh, charm. Uncle Nick, will you please take your hand off my breast? Oh. The plot finds Cousin Eddie working at a nuclear testing facility. His boss is played by Fred Willard, because this movie couldn't disgrace just one recently deceased comedy legend. It's not Roy we're letting go, Eddie. It's you. Monkey! Here, Eddie is bitten by a chimpanzee. <coughs> and he and his family are awarded a tropical vacation to an island in the South Pacific as a result. 
We find this out through some very subtle exposition. An all expense paid Christmas vacation on an island in the South Pacific. <gasps> Although I swear, the South Pacific looks exactly like the suburban Chicago we saw earlier. Because it is. It's the same set. And this is definitely an island in the South Pacific and not Southern California. You can tell by that crystal clear water. It's while on a fishing cruise that their boat gets beached on an island. In a sequence that features some truly stunning special effects that actually managed to make that awful green screen sled scene in the first movie look like something from Jurassic Park by comparison. So at 37 minutes in, they finally get to the island adventure portion of the movie. I guess that's why it's so small in the title. But wait, their boat wasn't sinking or anything. How are they going to explain being stuck here? Look! The boat's drifting away! Really? That's how we're going to explain that away? You're really going to Poochie returns to his home planet with a boat? Oh god! Alright, let's just move on. Eddie and the family are now stranded, and everyone adjusts accordingly. When you get to be my age, a good dump is one of the great pleasures in life. I don't even think that line was part of the movie. I think Ed Asner just wandered into the frame on his break or something. A lot of bananas. So from here, the rest of the plot revolves around Eddie trying to hunt for food, Uncle Nick being creepy. How about a full body massage? Uncle Nick! And the forced Christmas theming. Do you know, with all the excitement of the shipwreck and everything, I guess I just forgot all about Christmas. I assure you, Catherine, as the audience, we also forgot. And it wouldn't be a National Lampoon movie without almost showing nudity. You know, if nothing else, this movie really puts into perspective how great the Cousin Eddie character is as a supporting character. <laughs> Eddie? In the first vacation, for instance, he and his family appear 27 minutes in, and they leave the story just 9 minutes later. In Christmas Vacation, he doesn't appear until 42 minutes in, which is almost halfway through the movie, and in Vegas Vacation, he comes in at 24 minutes in. These movies knew how to use the character correctly. The reason Cousin Eddie is such a memorable character is due to how he contrasts to the rest of his family. Yeah, I bet you could use a cool one, huh? Now you're talking. <laughs> the comedy comes from the reactions of the characters around him. There needs to be those audience surrogates that roll their eyes at him or make a comment under their breath. That thing had nine lives, she just spent them all. <laughs> Woo! Here, not only is Eddie the main character and present in nearly every scene, he's also made to be the most relatable character here. And that's a stretch because it's Cousin Eddie, the same guy that dumps human waste on the sidewalk. Can anyone really relate to him? When the movie does wrap up and Eddie finally gets rescued, I'm left not knowing what the movie has less to do with. National Lampoon or Christmas? Both things that are in the title. In watching this bizarre movie, it really becomes the perfect representation of everything that went wrong with National Lampoon. The rap music on beer commercials? And junk mail? Yeah! Both the brand and this movie are cheap, rushed, soulless representations of something beloved. National Lampoon was a label that originally represented the triumph of the everyman. Underdogs that spoke out to the elite, but that also had a lot of heart. National Lampoon was never just a brand that you could slap over a title. It was a generation. It was a group of really talented writers and comedians that came together to produce something that had never been seen before. When you think of National Lampoon, try not to think of this, but rather of this. These amazing oddballs and underdogs that not only inspired a generation, but changed comedy forever. <laughs>